Okay, Marco, sorry. You, uh, you have to get this done in five minutes. This is the best talk. Uh, yeah, a little more time. Now. <coughs> Linda, what time are we having lunch? <laughs> okay, Marco, you have 15 minutes. <laughs> Can you hear me? Or yes. you working? Okay, good. Um, my name is Marcos Gironda. Just a really brief background since I only have 15 minutes. <laughs> um, I was born in uh, Venice, Italy, which uh, for those of you who haven't been there, almost looks like Venice Beach. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, as you can tell, not a lot of people uh, surf grass in, in Venice, Italy. <laughs> uh, therefore, uh, I actually decided to move uh, uh, fairly quickly. Uh, I went to high school uh, in uh, Chile, in Atacama Desert, and then I got my master's between Italy, Spain, uh, and Auburn University. Uh, and after my master was done, I moved to New Mexico State uh, to get my PhD. And from New Mexico State, once I got my PhD last year, I joined Dr. Bear's lab uh, in at UCR. So uh, I might be what's called a desert rat because uh, every place I live is uh, is, uh, is a desert. <laughs> so I've heard uh, a lot of uh, good uh, objection uh, and a lot of good thoughts on the fact if we should or should not have turf grass here. Um, this map shows you the environmental factor we're dealing with in the US. So, well, everybody knows, I mean, I don't need to come from Italy to tell you that Arizona and California are warmer than Montana. Everybody knows that, right? <laughs> okay. But this map, what really shows you is the kind of grass you should um, grow and in which environment. Warm stays for warm season and cool stays for cool season. And there's this huge zone here called transition zone where both grass, grasses are adapted. Now, I totally agree with you that some of these grasses, and I might disagree with Jim, but I think that some of these grasses that were presented today, they should not be in California. They are not well adapted to be grown in California. But uh, think about this. Um, if you think that only uh, grasses that are originating in the US or uh, around here should be grown here, do you know where corn was originated from? Do you know where tomato was originated from? Tobacco was originated in the US. <laughs> 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 The problem with warm season turf grasses, and this picture tells you the biggest truth of your life, the grass is always greener on the other side. <laughs> Long winter dormancy. Uh, now, this is not, here in California, it's not as dramatic. I took this picture in New Mexico, where we literally have uh, six months of dormancy a year. Um, while your neighbor can make fun of you uh, because your grass is dormant, you can still tell them, uh, hey, are you watering? I am not. I'm saving my money. And not only that, I'm being more environmentally friendly than you are because I'm growing a grass that is adapted to this climate. If you ask me personally what kind of grass should I have in my lawn, my answer will always be, you should, you have to grow in California, in Southern California especially, a world season turf grass. Uh, so, uh, I have uh, five or six species actually to, to present. The first one is uh, Bermuda grass. The origin of Bermuda grass uh, is Asia, particularly India. But what do you study when you study your introductory plant breeding uh, class is this. Grasses um, have a center of origin and then uh, some of them are readapted and therefore they have center of development. In environments where they're readapted, they have still, it, it, it's almost like dogs, think about it. Dogs all have the same genome, right? But then you have different breeds. There's Chihuahua, German Shepherd. Myself, I had a Bernese Mountain dog, right? <laughs> it's the same thing with Bermuda grass. 
the origin of Bermuda grass is Asia, the center of this development for Bermuda grass are everywhere in the world. And you know where the closest one is? From here, it's Arizona. So when you think that some grasses should not be here, then maybe you should study their history. Because we have a center of development for Bermuda grass right in our neighbor state. And in fact, one of the first cultivars of Bermuda grass was called Arizona Common. Now, it looked terrible, it was a weed, but it still originated here, so it means it's really well adapted to this kind of, envir of environment. Uh, the growth habit of Bermuda grass, you can see it in, uh, uh, when they're passing the plant. Uh, it has a lot of stolons and a lot of rhizomes. Bermuda grass is a really aggressive species. The stolons are the runners. Whoever has the plant can see it. There are some runners over there. The things, yeah, the green parts that are sticking out. And uh, rhizomes, you don't see them because they grow below the um, they grow below the surface. Propagation uh, for turf grasses are mostly uh, vegetatively, uh, which means uh, you can put solder or you can put sprigs. But some of them uh, are uh, um, propagated also by seed. And uh, um, I will talk to you more in depth about it later. Now, Bermuda grass is heat, drought, disease, mowing, and wear tolerant. Bermuda grass tolerates everything. And when it dies, thanks to the rhizomes, it can come back. <laughs> it does. <laughs> So the optimum growth uh, is uh, um, 85 uh, to 100 Fahrenheit. The only thing that stops Bermuda grass is shade. So if you have a lot of trees, maybe that's not your best option. That's not the best option for your backyard. It's often considered invasive. Uh, why? Because it comes back. It always comes back. But we have, uh, uh, we have this proverb in Italy, if you cannot defeat them, then just make them your friend. So you know that at a certain point of your life, uh, your lawn is going to experience some Bermuda grass invasion. It's going to come. So at that point, if you cannot get rid of it, just start growing it. <laughs> and, if you can, and if you can grow good varieties, actually, you can actually have a, a pretty nice looking uh, better. Now, mowing height of Bermuda grass, uh, you can mow them as low as one eighth of an inch, but that's only for uh, uh, golf greens. Those are the so-called dwarf types. They were developed, uh, especially for the south, to uh, replace cool season turf grasses in golf greens. So they have uh, uh, slightly lower input uh, golf greens that are more environmental friendly. And usually homeowners, they like to mow up to an uh, inch and a half. Still it grows a lot, especially during the, during the summer, you might have been mowing two to three times a week. It's a really, it, it requires a lot of care. Fertilization, uh, you can go from uh, four to eight pound, pound per nitrogen uh, per thousand square feet, of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. How do you do that? Um, usually you can do it in uh, four uh, different applications uh, of uh, one or two pounds. Never exceed two pounds, otherwise the grass is going to die. Excessive nitrogen actually kills the plant. Uh, or you can do it in a longer application or of a three quarter of a pound. NPK ratio, it's nitrogen, potassium, uh, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium uh, is a four to one to two. Why is that? Because nitrogen uh, um, improves uh, uh, the growth of uh, green tissues. And that's what you want for turf grasses. You don't actually want them to flower. So uh, if you give, uh, this means, if you, if you give eight pounds of nitrogen per year per thousand square feet, you should give uh, uh, two phosphorus and four of potassium. Irrigation uh, goes uh, ranges below zero, uh, three quarter and uh, inch of a quarter of water per week. Uh, now this, this uh, amount is only for the warm season. It's only during summer uh, and fall. Because when grasses goes dormant, you actually can irrigate only once per week. You turn off for 10 minutes your irrigation system, and that's it. Grass is going to come back. Uh, no problem in the spring. 
uh, you can find, since Budagras is really well adapted to California, you can find as many cultivars as you want. These are the most famous commercially available um, Bermuda grass cultivars. T42, I would say, is the princess. Is the number one uh, grown Bermuda grass around here. It's the improvement of T42. Every Bermuda grass, every cultivar that starts with T42 means it was developed in Tifton, Georgia, but it actually um, performs really well in California as well. Uh, it's vegetative, you can either plug it or uh, you can lay down salt. It's traffic tolerant, dark green, uh, you name it. Really high quality turf grass. On the entire trials, uh, is always among the top five uh, uh, performing cultivars. Uh, GM1 uh, is uh, grass also used for sports field. Uh, it's a little coarser than Tifway, but in my, oops, excuse me. It might be actually a little more tolerant to stresses, to stresses than this way. This board uh, is uh, um, really similar to this way, but it's more cold tolerant. It's called this sport because they use it on sports field, uh, especially those sports that are played during uh, during the winter, like football, and so it stays greener. Um, it stays greener longer. Uh, this green uh, is uh, the variety that actually they use in golf greens. Is a really high management. It needs a lot of um, inputs. Uh, so if you have a lawn, do never grow teeth, teeth, way, uh, teeth green in your uh, backyard. Now uh, there are two new. These are relatively new varieties. One is Bullsai, and the other one is Bandera. And they're trying to introduce some kind of shade tolerance into Bermuda grass. I already told you that the only things that stop Bermuda grass is the shade. These two uh, cultivars might actually tolerate uh, some shade. Not as much as the cool season, for sure, but they still grow. The shade does not stop, stop their growth. And then we have uh, the seaweed cultivars. Uh, Bermuda Triangle, uh, I actually have no experience. I just found it uh, on the internet. <coughs> and uh, Princess 77 is actually, this one is the it's really important because it was the first seeded variety that matched the quality of uh, um, solid variety. Usually seeded variety had lower qualities. Princess 77 was the first one that matched exactly the quality of uh, um, solid variety for Bermuda grass. Now, why do I put this here if they don't look so good? It's because uh, establishment cost of seeded variety are usually a third of uh, uh, vegetative propagated uh, cultivars. So if you want to, if you want to seed your backyard, it actually it's actually way cheaper than sodding or spray. And princess is the best. Princess is. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Bermuda Triangle looks as good. Just, just say yes. Just yeah, say yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Just go for princess. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Her name is Princess. Her name That's is Princess. Oh, very, yes. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely the best. <laughs> Princess 77 is really good. Princess 77. Next uh, species is Zoysia grass. Actually, um, I should talk about species because uh, uh, what they call Zoysia grass or what the far uh, salt farmers call Zoysia grass are indeed uh, three different species. One uh, is uh, uh, Zoysia japonica, one is Zoysia metrella, and one is Zoysia termifolia. The difference between these three species are the leaf texture. Zoysia japonica is coarser, but is more cold resistant. Zoysia metrella is uh, in between the two, and Zoysia termifolia is actually not cold resistant, but the leaf blade is really fine, so it's more appealing to, to the eye. Uh, the origin is Southwest Asia and Japan. For Zoysia japonica, the name says it comes from Japan. Uh, the growth habit is often stoliferous. It has a lot of stones. Sometimes uh, um, it produces bryzons too. The propagation is uh, mainly uh, vegetative. It's really slow to establish from seed. This says that it's not fast to establish from, uh, from uh, uh, stolons. Actually, the problem with zoysia grass, as you can see, 
it looks really nice. It almost looks like a cousis on turf grasses. The blade is really fine and it's really dense. The problem is that establishing soil in the grass is a really long process. It can take even up to two years uh, if you have the wrong cultivars in your backyard. You really need to find something that is adapted to, to your microenvironment. Uh, Georgia grass has a pretty nice uh, heat uh, and salt and drought tolerance, not as tolerant as Bermuda grass though. Like if you have problem with salt and heat, you should choose, you should go with Bermuda grass over Georgia grass, although Georgia grass looks nicer. Um, newer cultivars are more cold tolerant, actually this is the highest cold tolerant uh, species among the, cool season, uh, the warm season turf grasses. And uh, as I told you, it's really dense, it looks really nice. Were those mushrooms in the lower left? Oh, no, these are dead leaf. Sorry? Uh, dead leaf. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Dead. Yeah. In the lower left hand quadrant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's. Uh, this is scalping right here. Not passing by. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, as I told you, it's really slow to establish. So be really careful. You might face, for sure, at least one year to establish a uh, backyard. You might actually look to two seasons, uh, two complete seasons to have a full backyard, a, a backyard complete cover. It is susceptible to diseases, way more than Bermuda grass. In Southern California, it's considered it's susceptible to large patch that is also called uh, uh, zoysia patch around here. And uh, will brown uh, way before Bermuda grass during drought. It is drought tolerant, but it's not as, uh, um, as aggressive as Bermuda grass. Mowing heights are between uh, 0 0.5 and 2.5 and inches. 2.5 uh, inches is fine if you don't want to mow your lawn that frequently. Actually, since it's really slow grower, it's uh, slow to establish, you don't have to mow it as much as Bermuda grass. Fertilization is a little lower than Bermuda grass, uh, between two and uh, four uh, uh, pounds per nitrogen uh, per thousand square feet per year. And MPK ratio is two to one to one, uh, meaning it likes a little more uh, uh, phosphorus and potassium than, than Bermuda grass itself. Irrigation uh, is one and uh, one and a half inch of water uh, per week uh, per, uh, uh, of water per week. It's a little higher than Bermuda grass, but it's not drastically higher. It's almost the same. And again, during the winter, you just switch off your irrigation and you're not watering your lawn. Common cultivars. Uh, the Alta uh, is really common. Uh, is this the one that comes from? Yeah, Chile, this is right? what you're looking at. It's going across the tables. Is uh, That's De Anza, which is shout out for UCR. That was developed at uh, at UCR, and uh, we didn't put it there, but the um, sort of its claim to fame is uh, it was it was bred for uh, longer color retention going into the winter, and so it uh, it, it it is like as Marco said, it's um, you know, like compared to Bermuda, zoysias are not that good, but I'd say De Anza is probably clo the closest to uh, you know Bermuda grass in terms of retaining the color. Going in the winter. And so, well, uh, Diamonda is actually a uh, Zoysia metrella, so it has uh, uh, finer leaves uh, and it's pretty good shape tolerant to be a worse season turf grass. El Toro is uh, vegetated, the faster establishment doesn't mean it's fast, it just means it's faster than the rest. <laughs> <laughs> But also a UC Riverside. Riverside. Also, uh, and this comes actually from Mayer, right? This was developed from Mayer, and Mayer was one of the oldest ones. He was considered the standard zoysia grass. It was developed in the 50s, uh, and that was the standard zoysia grass for, for a long time. Uh, Zenit is actually a really important cultivar right now. Uh, you can get it vegetative and seed. My suggestion is always go for plugs, never seed zoysia grass. And it's really disease resistant if you live uh, in an area with higher precipitation, maybe not in the desert. And then uh, uh, Doro is dense, uh, dark green, uh, and uh, shade tolerant too. Now, uh, we're moving on to San Augustine grass. San Augustine grass is a uh, native uh, uh, to the other side of the Pacific, uh, West Indies uh, and Australia. It 
the Crips, it's a runner as well. It creeps mostly uh, by means of stolons, but it also has uh, uh, rhizomes. Now, this grass is way cold, coarser than, uh, um, than Bermuda grass and Zoysia grass. You can clearly see the difference uh, uh, whenever you get the plant in the leaf coarseness uh, uh, between these uh, and the previous grasses. It propagates only vegetatively because uh, it actually the seeds that it produces are really not viable. So you will only find uh, um, um, spread to plant in the backyard. It produces a really dense cover. Uh, therefore, it's really good for weed management because when your uh, uh, soil is completely covered, that leaves no space uh, to weed uh, germination. It's a uh, really shade tolerant. It's number one shade tolerant. If you have uh, uh, if you're living uh, along the coast and you have a lot of trees, this is the grass you should go to. And it's fairly it's fairly salt tolerant. That's why it's pretty well adapted to coastal conditions too. It's uh, kind of slow grower, uh, not as low as uh, zoysia grass for sure, but it is as lower than Bermuda grass. Uh, leaves, as I told you, and as you can see, are way coarser than uh, than the previous uh, one season grasses, but it's less drought tolerant and less traffic tolerant than Bermuda grass, and that's why it's really not used in sport fields. Mowing heights. Now, this grass requires less input than the previous warm season turf grasses. As you can see, mowing heights are two to four inches. Never mowing below two inches because it scalps a lot and it does not recover. Therefore, uh, uh, you actually can mow it once a week or something like that. Fertilization, lower than Bermuda grass and soja grass. Two to five pound uh, of uh, nitrogen uh, per thousand square feet per year. Two actually might actually be enough. That's all you have to give to this grass are two pounds of nitrogen uh, divided in uh, um, four applications of half a pound per year, so not a lot. Um, phosphorus uh, and potassium actually doesn't even need it. As I told you that um, the seeds are not viable and it doesn't really flower that much, you do not need to provide a lot of phosphorus and potassium. This is true if your soil has a decent concentration of it. So it's always better if you test your soil and see if it's completely lacking of one of these two elements. If it's completely lacking, you can just give a, a, give a small doses together with your nitrogen. Irrigation uh, uh, is a little higher than Bermuda grass and zoysia grass uh, since it's not as drought tolerant. Uh, usually irrigation is applied as needed, meaning that when the grass uh, is starting to wilt, when you first see the, um, the signs of wildness, then you turn on your, uh, your irrigation system. And uh, for a long time, like usually for 45 minutes to one hour, but only when it's wilting. Uh, common cultivars are palmetto. Palmetto is the most common cultivar in the US, I think. It has shorter blades, uh, uh, so it's actually a slow grower, so you really don't have to mow it that often. Uh, performance uh, St. Augustine grass uh, has the highest shade tolerance. You will probably not find any other warm season turf grasses that tolerate uh, shade as much as performance uh, uh, um, St. Augustine grass. Then there's a uh, uh, sun clips that's fairly wear resistant. Again, it's more wear resistant than the other, does not mean it's entirely uh, wear resistant. And then uh, uh, Captiva and Sapphire are dwarf, which means uh, you can mow them uh, uh, even less than once a week, once every 10 days. Now, Seashore Cross Palum, uh, this is right now is uh, probably my favorite grass. It looks, uh, it's native to Africa and the Americas. Um, it looks a lot, a lot, uh, the growth habit looks a lot like Bermuda grass, but it's darker green. If well maintained, uh, seashore paspalum uh, has a nicer texture and has a nicer color than Bermuda grass. It's uh, probably exactly just like Bermuda grass, both by seed and uh, by soil. Uh, excellent resistance to salinity. Uh, and for excellent, 
I mean that you can water it with ocean water and it still survives. So if you live right on the coast, uh, you can actually pick up the water from the ocean and with the bucket and dump it on the grass. It will still survive. It is, uh, on the other hand, still, it is not as drought resistant as Bermuda grass. This uh, is going into dormancy way before Bermuda grass if drought happens. Uh, and it has really, really poor cold tolerance. Um, meaning that if your temperature during uh, winter night go below 20 Fahrenheit, then at that point you cannot grow seashore paspalum. That is the cutting point. If you have a big frost, 20 Fahrenheit should be your cutting point. If you have a big frost, uh, uh, like 10 or either zero, the next spring uh, it's really hard to see seashore paspalum coming back from Dormancy. Moy height, exactly like Bermuda grass, um, uh, eight of an inch uh, for only for dwarf cultivars, only for cultivars that are used uh, to build uh, uh, golf greens, to one inch and a half. Fertilization, uh, okay, um, Ronnie Duncan, which is the, the, the father of this grass, uh, said that you should fertilize seashore paspalum less than Bermuda grass. When I've been working with it for the last uh, seven to eight years, uh, and I always saw that I think that they should be fertilized exactly the same. If you fertilize the short paspalum with two pounds of nitrogen uh, uh, per thousand square feet per year, it will become starving. It will lose a lot of color. That's why I told you that if it's well maintained, actually this looks better than the real grass. But you need to maintain it really well. So my suggestion is uh, between four and six pounds of nitrogen uh, uh, per thousand square feet per year. Ratio is 1.5 to one. Still, this is Ronnie Duncan, the father of seashore paspalum, telling us that it doesn't, it doesn't need phosphorus at all. It only needs uh, uh, potassium. Oh, excuse me. Uh, <coughs> I would not take these, uh, these Data is for sure. I would fertilize seashore paspalum exactly how I fertilize Bermuda grass. Irrigation, uh, um, lower, lowest irrigation is like one inch per week. Uh, uh, it's a little higher than Bermuda grass because it is not as drought resistant as Bermuda grass. Common cultivars, there are not many because it's a relatively new uh, grass. It actually, the first book about seashore paspalum came out. 10 years ago, I think. Um, Platinum, Aloha, Seagull, Sea Isle, uh, they're pretty common. You can find them at salt farms. Uh, sea dwarf uh, is uh, the dwarf type, the one that's used for golf green. You do not use it for a backyard, for sure. Uh, Aloha is uh, really nice, really dark green. And uh, uh, it has a high shoot density, which means uh, it's really aggressive. So it will establish really fast. And uh, uh, platinum is dark green too. Uh, if you have dogs or kids, it's more tolerant, so it's actually a pretty nice grass. Sea spray is the seeded one, uh, developed in 2008, so really, really new to the market. Was the first, and right now is the only seeded cultivar of seashore pastalum. In Southern California, well, in Riverside, uh, from seed to full cover, to full uh, ground cover, it's uh, three months, even less than that. It's really fast growing, uh, really aggressive, and really nice grass. And uh, here we are, buffalo grass, uh, the, native, the native grass. Now, uh, growth habit is mostly stolons. You don't really see many rhizomes. Uh, and it's, I don't even know how to pronounce it in English. Do you, yes. 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 Okay. Do you guys know what it means? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> uh, it means, okay, so male flowers are uh, uh, on top of the grass, female flowers are below the grass, you don't see them, and they actually, when they produce seed, they actually produce burrs, so it means if you're walking barefoot, uh, you're going to get uh, pinched by wow. that. Yes. <laughs> the pollen uh, is shaped from uh, the top, from the anthers and uh, pollinates uh, the, the female flower, which is actually the, the spike, the spiklet, which is actually below the grass. So when you don't see it, you can actually pinch yourself. So it's not really nice, it's like no time. 
Uh, you can propagate it by seed and vegetatively, both. Uh, Buffalo grass uh, is uh, really drought, heat, and cold tolerant. Uh, the three of them. Actually, their dormancy period is uh, the lowest, is the shortest uh, between warm season turf grasses. I would say that uh, dormancy of buffalo grass in desert environments can be two months long, and then it recovers. Usually, it's January, February, and in March, it's already green. It already comes back. It's lighter color, for sure. It is lighter color than uh, the previous warm season grasses, uh, and it's re it has really sparse color. Um, this is a problem because of wind. Now, this is a picture taken on one of our studies. It is a traffic study. You can see traffic part is full of weed. Non-traffic part, is a, there's actually buffalo grass does not tolerate traffic, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, since it has a sparse color, you will see a lot of weed coming uh, if you have uh, a lot of activities on this kind of grass. It's a really low maintenance grass. You don't even need to take care of it. Now, will it look good? Will it look pretty? Probably not. But <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of grass that you see the, or uh, you saw, the, and uh, uh, you just forget you have it. You just let it grow, no problem. Uh, mowing height is never below two inches. You can mow it once a week, never below two inches because it scalps a lot and it does not recover from uh, scalping. Fertilization, do not exceed two pounds uh, of uh, nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. Uh, it actually does not take any advantage if you give uh, any more nitrogen than that. Uh, this means that you can actually go lower in fertilization, or you can even do not fertilize it if you don't want to. Uh, Anti-K ratio is the same as Bermuda grass whenever you fertilize it. Irrigation, uh, one inch of water per week, totally sufficient and as needed. Uh, it means that whenever it starts wilting, you just turn down the irrigation for uh, 30 minutes, that's it, once per week, no problem. Common cultivar in Southern California, only ones, only one, UC Verde, which is the one we are looking at, and it was developed, uh, as you see, it was developed between Riverside and Davis, right? Yeah. Uh, why only one? Because this one is the most uh, heat tolerant. It was developed to perform well in our environment. Buffalo grass is native from the Great Plains, mostly, and so is more uh, cold tolerant than heat tolerant for being a warm season turf grasses. Turf grass. UC Verde is uh, actually uh, fairly cold tolerant in comparison to other varieties of, uh, of buffalo grass. You can only plug it. You do not find seeds, and uh, uh, solder is uh, not, uh, I would say, dense enough. Therefore, if you have some salt and you try to pull it, it will just river. And therefore, uh, UC Verde only dries. And then we have Kikuyu grass, one, which is going to be our last one. It's going to be a little over 15 minutes, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, origin uh, is uh, East Africa. This is actually a relatively new uh, grass. Considered as turf grass, this was considered uh, as um, as a, as a weed, as an obnoxious weed, in fact. Still, still yeah, still considered. Yeah, still considered. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> uh, growth I did really big rules uh, from uh, both rhizomes and stones. Uh, a lot of rhizomes, and just like Bermuda grass, it's a really hard uh, grass to get rid of. Uh, propagated both by uh, vegetatively or seed. It's uh, reasonably drought tolerant. Uh, it's originated in Africa, so it's actually not as drought tolerant as the most drought tolerant Bermuda grass, but still, we're, we're almost there. Optimum growth is uh, actually a little cooler than Bermuda grass. It has good soil tolerance uh, it, and it has really limited dormancy period in California. Uh, does it go into dormancy in Riverside or? It will, but uh, yeah, just said another way, it's uh, of the warm season grasses, it probably stays green just the yeah. longest, especially coastal or coastal environments. Problem, uh, coarse leaves. Uh, 
visually, a visual appeal is not really high. <coughs> Molly height uh, is one to uh, an inch and a half, and fertilization is really low, just like buffalo grass, uh, a couple of pounds uh, of nitrogen uh, uh, per thousand square feet per year. And irrigation is uh, more or less the same as seashore pasture. Uh, common cultivars, there's uh, only two, uh, Widit and AZ1. Uh, AZ1 was taken from Widit, right? right? Yeah, it's a selection from it. Yeah. Uh, we did has broader leaves uh, than than easy one and thicker stems. Uh, it's actually really persistent on your on your uh, uh, ground, and AZ has a more compact growing habit. And with that, I'm done. But if you have any questions.